In the summer of 1987, Fish spent much of their time playing the bar scene in Burlington, Vermont. Just a decade later, they drew 70,000 fans to Limestone, Maine, where they threw a legendary festival called The Great Went. On August 17, 1997, Fish played a version of their song, Bathtub Gin, that is widely considered to be one of the band's best improvisations of all time. Hi, I'm Amar Sastry, and welcome to Anatomy of a Jam. This is The Went Gin. When it comes to the word jam, so many people envision a meandering musical performance that is as forgettable as it is meaningless. Whereas a good fish jam, particularly this one, is a transcendent, spontaneous musical conversation that travels through multiple themes and movements. It is as thoughtful and compelling as it is a masterful display of musical creativity and discipline. A truly memorable fish jam won't just defy your expectations as a listener, it'll cause you to experience emotions that you didn't even know existed. Bathtub Gin combines music written by fish guitarist Trey Anastasio with lyrics by one of his longtime friends, Susanna Goodman. The album slash liner notes for Lawn Boy mentioned that the lyrics were permission of Brett and Wendy, who happened to be two of the main characters in the song. Goodman's lyrics paint a carefree, psychedelic medieval world complete with jesters, impatient royalty, and of course, bootleg liquor. Bathtub Gin first appeared in the 1920s in the US as a general term for brewing any kind of homemade spirit. The Fish song happens to take an enormous amount of inspiration from a groundbreaking piece of entertainment from the 1920s, George Gershwin's Rhapsody in Blue. Paige McConnell's jarring open lines to Bathtub Gin are drawn from a dark portion of the first piano solo in Gershwin's masterpiece. Most famously, the chorus of Jin directly quotes a central theme of Rhapsody in Blue, one that is repeated throughout the entire piece. Prohibition-era slang and musical quotes aside, these two songs are bound by one major compositional device, humor. It's easy to hear that Jin is an inherently funny song, particularly in its outward circus-like bounce and whimsical lyrics. The song is full of little musical jokes, such as the extra beats between repetitions of the chorus, the harmonized major thirds that Trey and Paige sing in the song's main theme, creating a catchy, light-hearted dissonance, And let's not forget the irony of thousands of hippies relishing the very thought of cleanliness. Cause we're all in this together, and we love to take a bath. Gershwin was well known for using humor in his compositions, and Rhapsody in Blue is no exception. The very beginning of the piece includes an inside joke between Gershwin and Ross Gordman, the virtuoso clarinetist in Paul Whiteman's orchestra. During a rehearsal, Gordman exaggerated the opening glissando and made it wail, purely as a gag. And Gershwin thought it was so funny he wrote it into the piece. It soon became one of the most iconic introductions in modern musical history. Gershwin told his first biographer, Isaac Goldberg, in 1931 how Rhapsody in Blue spontaneously unfolded in his imagination while he was traveling on the train between Boston and New York for the opening of his musical comedy, Sweet Little Devil. 
It was on the train, with its steely rhythms, its rattly bang, that is so often stimulating to a composer. I frequently hear music in the very heart of the noise. And there suddenly I heard, and even saw on paper, the complete construction of the rhapsody from beginning to end. I heard it as a sort of musical kaleidoscope of America, of our vast melting pot, of our unduplicated national pep, of our metropolitan madness. This idea of being musically inspired by the sounds around us is a similar deep inspiration for Trey Anastasio. In an interview with Guitar World in 2004, he was asked about his habit of staring up and over the crowd as he plays, and how it looks like he's really listening to something. I don't want it to sound ridiculous, but I definitely feel like I'm listening to something. I have this feeling that there's a pattern that exists. I really do believe this. I mean, I know it. I'm sure of it. Right now, if you listen, right now in this room, I can hear about a thousand layers of rhythm. The air conditioner, the air, the sound in my head, there's tones. It's all there, and it's just the sound of life. And if you listen to it and play it, people respond. And when I'm playing on stage, I find myself looking out, not usually into people's faces, but over their heads and up. And the endless possibilities, the depth of it all, occasionally will come to you. It's this ability that makes Trey such an effective conduit of the music, and the reason why every improvisation is a complete, unique monster. The jam in the Went Gin starts at the 4 minute 44 second mark. This one starts the way pretty much all gin jams do, with the band casually improvising in the C Mixolydian mode. C Mixolydian is similar to the C major scale, but the seventh degree is flattened, giving a more laid back sound. This idea of looking at modes as modified major scales is known as parallel construction. Soon, we'll see how the band uses this as they collaboratively shift between C major and C mixolydian, like they're hopping back and forth between two different yet clearly related worlds. Just a few seconds into the jam, we start to hear some purposeful interplay. Trey quotes the melody at the 5 minute 2 second mark, and then Fishman reacting to him playfully starts to stagger the beat. Trey then staggers the melody rhythmically in an effort to react to Fishman. Around the 6 minute 51 second mark, Fishman drops into halftime. And Trey doesn't particularly want to, as evidenced by the glance he shoots him. Trey quotes the melody again at the 7 minute 21 second mark and still isn't happy with Fishman dropping in and out of halftime. Around the 7 minute 30 second mark, Trey fist pumps in approval once Fishman develops a strong, consistent groove on the drums. This new beat creates a spark in the band's creativity. The jam takes its first major turn just a few seconds later, where Mike Gordon spontaneously composes a bass line that takes them out into a new progression. He starts playing the notes C, A, F, and G. Trey 
This is the turning point in the jam, the impetus for the very peak and substance of the performance itself. Up until now, the improvisation in Bathtub Gin has been decidedly type 1. The band has been improvising in a fixed chord progression or mode. The notes that Mike has been playing, C, A, F, and G, are hinting from changing from a C mixolydian sound to a C major sound. Let's take a look at our C major scale again. If we take every third note and put it on top of each note in our scale, we get dyads. In this case, we've created dyads with major and minor thirds. If we take every fifth note and put it on top of our dyads, we get triads that we commonly call chords. You can mix and match these chords in countless ways to create a chord progression. For example, here we've got the building block of popular music in the last 100 years, the 1-4-5 progression, which in the key of C would be C, F, G. As we mentioned before, Gordon is playing the notes C, A, F, G, which in the key of C means that he's implying the root notes of a 1-6-4-5 progression, or the chords C, A minor, F, G. Mike is sowing the seeds of a type 2 jam where the original chord progression or mode is abandoned and a new one is established essentially out of thin air. Trey hears Mike developing this new harmony and stops soloing in the traditional sense. This creates a bit of a harmony hole. Instead of playing chords or notes that imply chords, Trey is just playing the note C in different octaves. It is now up to Paige and Mike to develop the harmony, because Trey has consciously chosen not to. This was very intentional because the harmony is beautiful yet simple, and Trey stays out of the way to see where Mike and Paige will take it. At the 10 minute 18 second mark, the harmony that Mike has been implying evolves into C. A minor F, thanks to Paige, who joins him by actually playing these chords underneath Trey. We can say that this is the moment where the jam distinctly turns type 2. The C mixolydian sound, which was the original harmony of the bathtub gin jam, has been abandoned and a new improvised harmony has developed, the C A minor F progression. This whole time, Trey has been repeating a rhythmic figure and he starts slowly developing melodies by performing a theme in variation on a four note melody.
Trey's melody and one of the central themes of this jam has really been focusing on the notes C and G. Over the C chord, we still have a C chord, but over A minor, the melody creates an A minor 7 chord, and over the F chord, it creates an F major 9 chord. The F major 9 chord is beautiful and pleasingly tense, and you can feel the sigh of resolution every time we cycle back to the C chord. Notice how this glorious peak started with just a germ of an idea. Mike started this progression by outlining the root of a new chord progression. Paige picked up on it and modified it to C A minor F. Then Trey added an ostinato or repeating melody and created an overall C A minor F major 9 progression. But wait, we're not done yet. In a move of complete and utter telepathy, Paige abandons the harmony by going back to a C mixolydian sound from the 11 minute 44 second mark to the 12 minute 4 second mark. The rest of the band immediately picks up on this and stops playing the C A minor F chord progression. They start teasing a C mixolydian sound to complement what Paige is playing. Trey seizes his C major based melody and instead focuses on notes that are friendly to both C major and C mixolydian. This allows him to fit into the groove while avoiding any notes that may clash. However, this doesn't last long, and Paige and Mike bring back our three chord harmony around the 12 minute 5 second mark. At this point, Paige and Mike step aside and support Trey as he builds intensity by throwing in some fierce blues licks over our C A minor F chord progression. The band takes note and plays with more and more intensity, building the jam to a soaring peak. Trey finally lands at the jam's highest peak, where he composes a simple yet triumphant ostinato melody. Notice that his melody is really focused on the note C. Which is the root of the C chord, the minor third of the A minor chord, and the fifth of the F chord. The root third and fifth of any chord are considered to be very stable tones. This is why this theme makes us feel like we've arrived at home. The physics of Trey's lines give us a big sense of stability, yet the repetition creates tension and excitement and makes us feel like the moment could last forever, and often we wish it does. After some more peaking, Trey starts playing trills, which is often a signal to the rest of the band that he wants to end the jam or move to another section and that's exactly what happens. Most bathtub gin jams end with the band returning to the main chorus melody and then slowing down until they all crash into a big B flat chord. However, in this version, Trey plays rhythmic octaves and Fishman reacts by playing a rhythm that morphs into the classic bluegrass slash country fast train beat. Fish seamlessly segues into their arrangement of Bill Monroe's Uncle Pen, leaving Bathtub Gin 
unfinished. The Went Jin will always stand as a monument to Fish's ability to spontaneously craft a masterpiece out of thin air, and for the audience's ability to trust them to take us on a journey that we'll never forget. Because it's never just about the notes, or the chords, or the scales, but it's about our ability to come together and appreciate the magic that they create.